Wouldn't it be nice to have several thought leaders in your industry know and love your brand? Start a podcast. Invite your industry's thought leaders to be guests on your show. And start reaping the benefits of having a network full of industry influencers. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to B2B Growth. I am your host for today's episode, Nikki Ivey with Sweetfish Media. Guys, I've got with me today, Steve Brook, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer at MSC Industrial Supply. Steve, how are you doing today? Fantastic, Nikki. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I am well. We were just talking about it offline. The sun is shining. I cannot complain. <laughs> Perfect. So we're going to be talking about basically how to not be annoying. Um, more, <laughs> That's more great lead in. <laughs> more specifically, uh, a few legion techniques to stop using please. Uh, and I can't wait to dig into this with you. Uh, but Steve, first, I would love it if you would just give us all a little bit of background on yourself and what you and the folks at MSC have been up to these days. You bet. So MSC, I'm sure for your audience, it may be uh, a new company. So we've been around for about 80 years. MSC is one of the leading distributors of what we call MRO products. Uh, MRO stands for maintenance, repair, and operating uh, supplies for manufacturing and the, the, man, the manufacturing space. And Nikki, we serve about 300,000 customers. We supply about 5,000 suppliers' uh, products to them, uh, about a million and a half different items. And we do that uh, you know, in the U.S., Canada, Mexico, with an omni-channel approach. So we've got sellers, we've got digital, we've got direct mail, uh, you name it. And our purpose, our lot in life, is to try to make those customers of, of ours, those manufacturers, better at what they do, make them more productive, make them more competitive, and make them better in their space. So that's us in a nutshell. I love y'all in a nutshell. Um, there you go. I, I really like the, the, the very customer-centric approach that you just described, like, but not in a buzzy, we're customer-centric kind of way. It just really seems like that's the genuine mission behind the way that you guys do business. And, uh, and I, I respect that. I love that. That's close to my heart, man. Absolutely. Look, if if we're not doing something good for our customers, then what good are we? What what use are we? So that it's really all about making our customers better. And we feel like if we do that, then they're going to keep us around for a while. Right on, right on. So so let's get into it. Where we are right now in terms of you know these these lead gen practices that folks need to stop. Let's back it up a little bit and talk about how we got there. So one of the things that that you and I talked about offline is that we're in this place of unprecedented availability and access to the folks that we want to do business with. Talk to us a little bit about how that created the problem that we're discussing today. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. So I, I, I took a minute knowing we were going to have this conversation today and said, you know, let's just take a quick inventory of one day, one day of the uh, outreach that I get or one day of the messages that I receive. And, and I've got a, a handful of places where they come in. So my professional email, my personal email, there's a spam filter on both of those. There's a junk email collector on both of those. Uh, and, and I looked at just the total collection of everything that I got in one day on Friday, and it added up to over 305 emails in that given day. And that's before LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, any other social, any other voice messages, any other robocalls. I mean, just think about how bombarded we are these days. And it's because I think there is this wide availability of technology that, that allows for that easier connection. So people are not just using it, Nikki, but I would say abusing it. 
And I say this with a mountain of respect and empathy. I was on the other side of the phone. I did my fair share of dialing and smiling over the years. Mm -hmm. And so I get what people are trying to do. But man, oh man, I got to tell you, you know, that old Spider-Man saying that with great uh, data comes great responsibility. (laughs) And right now, I I don't think everybody is quite respecting, you know, the the access that's available these these days as, as maybe they should. Yeah. And I think maybe part of that is for fear that if they're respecting that access, the next person isn't. And then that person's got the edge. And that's, that can be really, it can play on your mind, man. That can be tough to, uh, tough to, to navigate, but it doesn't excuse it though. Right. So what I want to talk about is what, what are some of the, so that I don't keep committing them. Uh, (laughs) I know. (laughs) What are some of the worst offenses out there that we could, uh, we could start with focusing on leaving in the past. You know, and and like I I mentioned before, this is a little venting, so take this, you know, in the spirit that it's intended, also intended to be a little light, but you get to a point where your frustration overflows, and you just have to sound off a little bit. So one one that's particularly, to me, frustrating is when you get the note, uh, email, uh, typically, from a complete stranger, somebody you've never heard of in your life, and they ask you the question, if you're, are you the right contact at your company for whatever the good or service is? And by the way, if you're not, could you point me to the person who is? <laughs> <laughs> so now, from a complete stranger, they're asking you to refer them to somebody within your organization for something that you have no idea about. And this happens constantly. And I I just have to question, you know, how often that actually works that I'm going to go ahead and and refer you to a colleague within my company and and risk my credibility because you're looking for uh, the right person to prospect. I, I don't get it. Yeah, I, I don't do that anymore, but I can relate. Listen, I, I, I can remember a time when I was coached to do something similar to what you just described. And so I do understand why I was coached to do that thing and know better now. But what I love about, yes, you said this is sort of, it it is sort of light, but you know, what I, I love about it is that there is some constructive criticism happening here, right? Because what I've seen as an alternative is someone screenshots a message like that with all the sender's information in it and like posts it on LinkedIn and just totally rips this person apart, right? Right. Some, some young SCR that was just doing his or her job. Um, and so the fact that we've compiled these here, not just to say, hey, don't do this, but to talk about why it's not effective, I think is really, really key. And so the, the insidiousness of that one, is it, is it mostly based in just the fact that you don't know that person uh, or that they're asking you something before offering you anything? You know, it's a little bit, I think it's a little deeper than that. I think it, it, to me, it says, hey, I found you and I found your contact information, maybe your email address or your phone number. So I did something to find you, which tells you, you could do a little bit more to find the contact that you're looking for, by the way, and it would be better for you and for them, but you've elected to stop and not take that extra step. Instead, I'm going to put that homework on this one contact that I've found now and try to have them navigate me through their organization in the way that's you know, most effective for me. And so you know, the, the technology is there, the data is there, the information is there that you got to a certain point, but you didn't take that extra step to get to the next point. And if we can all relate to some of these prospecting techniques and say, yep, I've either seen that or I've done that a hundred times, then the receiving end of that has received that a hundred times. And you've now just put yourself back in the noise rather than tried to do something that would help you stand out, differentiate, and really be unique and interesting and uh, worthy of a response. Yeah, and you got to wonder, at an organization where that's, you know, built in, it's probably built into some sequence that you've been entered into, right? Some, some automation. How long have they been using that automation with little success and ignoring the data that it's not successful? Because right. at a certain point, like, you can internalize your failures and be, like, sad about them, or you can hustle, bro, porn them out and be like, if I just keep doing it though, or you can say, yup, that didn't work. It's a data point. 
let, how do I use this to move forward? Do you know what I mean? Right. I do. And you think about it, it and I, I tried to rationalize it or understand the, the, you know, kind of ongoing use of some of these techniques. And you say, hey, it must work for some percentage of the time for people to keep doing this. The extreme of that, right, would have to be rope those robo dialers, right? Those robo calls. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you've got to wonder, you know, how, how often can that possibly work? But it must be to some level that, uh, it, you know, perpetuates that, that technique or habit. But then think, Nikki, think for a second about that old adage of you only get one chance to make a first impression. And if your first impression trying to engage a company for future, uh, a future relationship and your first impression is one that's this poor because you haven't done, you know, the basic legwork or homework to know that company better that you want to engage with, Think about the potential brand damage that does to you to say, I'm engaging you and I'm not, I don't care enough about the future relationship to actually do some real work. So I'm going to see if I can't spray and pray and get something out of this, you know, broadcast email campaign. It's silly, really. Yeah, as we're, we're still on the same page here. I was just going to ask about that as far as how long or, what, or at what volume would some practice like this have to happen before you think it is going to start to affect the brand? Because I'll tell you what, in my experience, not very long, because it depends on who the person is that receives it. So I was, I was an SDR at this organization and I was responsible for, you know, just short of spamming people. <laughs> we were doing good yep. work and it was really important. And I really, at, 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 in my role as an SDR, I really believed in what we were Uh, selling and trying to accomplish. And so I had no problem reaching out to as many people as possible to evangelize them behind this deal. And and those are my very real and innocent and genuine intentions behind the volume with which I was reaching out to these people. But it didn't matter because what happened was when my events team ended up being at this conference, uh, their name had become, our name had become synonymous with, oh, those are the people that call you a bunch of times a day. Or those are the people where you can't even engage with their content without them you know, trying to have a, a million emails sent to you as a follow up and shove their message on your throat after that, and it was it hurt, it was so hurtful to me because I was like, no, I was just trying to like make friends with as many people as possible, and now I've like ruined the reputation. And I mean, have you seen and, things like that? And and you raise a really good point, Nikki. You raise a good point to say, look, a lot of this is done with with good interest in mind or best interest in mind, or at least with positive intent. Like nobody's waking up this morning saying, hmm, how many people can I annoy and aggravate with my emails today or with my outreach today or with my prospecting techniques today? So I totally get that. And that's why I always start off by saying it's with just, you know, a mountain of, of respect and empathy. But it's that stepping back and saying, are you really putting yourself in the shoes of the recipient and thinking through what their experience is? And to your point, what that long-term brand or per- perception uh, or reputational damage could be. And the one is another one that was on my list, the one that you mentioned, I call it the stalker. And that's the one where you do go and engage with somebody's content because you, you know, were uh, moved by some of their uh, whatever their messaging was, and there was enough awareness or, or intrigue created. And then after you've engaged with the content, you get that kind of creepy email afterwards saying, you know, I noticed that you were looking at my content. <laughs> thought you might want to have a phone call. And you're like, oh, you know, that's just, you passed the creepy line factor. I'm like, come on. It's ridiculous. I, but again, you're using the technology. It's available, right? We know that you can make those connections between content and email. Yeah, But man, be careful about how and when you do it. So it's not, you know, crossing the line. That's yeah, a good one. I've, you know what it, it reminds me of? It's like if you, so if you're on, so you get a friend request from someone, right? On Facebook and it accepts them on, on Facebook and on Messenger. And on Messenger, they can see your little green dot when you're online. And all at yeah. this point, the extent of the relationship is that you've accepted their friend request. And That's then the it. next time, like, hey, I saw your green dot on. I saw that you were online. And it's like, can you see me now? Do you know what I'm wearing? You're like, de friend, de friend, de friend. Right, right. Abort, abort, abort. And I've got like, a stage five stalker. What do I do? <laughs> and maybe that person had sweet things to say to me. I don't know. We'll never know because they, they crossed the creep line. Um, exactly. This, this is so much fun. And um, I, I really do love the spirit with which you are are giving this information. And now it's time for you to let us know how, how do we not, uh, 
Well, how do we turn this around, man? Yeah, look, and the answer is as easy as the problem, if you think about it, because there is so much noise, and, and we can all relate to all of these prospecting techniques. It tells you, hey, use the technology to your advantage and do something different than that crowd, and you're going to stand a stand out that much more than the crowd. So the information is available to get better, you know, in terms of who, who are you trying to contact? What's the segment that they're in? How much can you know about them? And I know this sounds like um, marketing speak, if you will, but if you just spend a little bit of time trying to understand who your contact is or who your target is and, and spend a little bit of time personalizing your message or, frankly, just making sure that your goods and services even apply to that potential target, sure. personalize the note just a little bit, and, man, they can just stick out uh, like nothing you've ever seen before. And you, in, in the same way that we can mock some of these techniques that start to get tired and, and old and what have you, we can all think also about those emails that we get that are so refreshing where it's somebody saying, hey, understand that this is what your company does. And I heard from your last earnings call that this is one of the things you guys were working on. We happen to be in that space. Do you have a few minutes? We could chat about it. Suddenly, now from a generic and, and you know, kind of uh, one size fits all approach, here's somebody who's taken just a minute to learn about something that you really might be genuinely interested in. And they reached out in a very um, sincere way they're so much more likely to get a response than some of these generic messages. Now, I get that that's a little bit harder, but you know, I, I think that the ratio of, of effort to response is also going to be orders of magnitude greater. Right. And it's like you said at the top, with, with uh, great data comes great responsibility. I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> I wish I could take credit for it. I think that is Spider Man. I'm not sure, but I'm going to go back to that. <laughs> I don't. He was. He was. His was a little bit different. He wasn't quite talking about data, but I want specifically yours, the where it there you data go. on a T-shirt. Uh, so this was great. I love the way you laid this out. I think it's just the sort of thing that you know, rather than putting people off and causing this knee jerk defensiveness about. Uh, these techniques that we use, I think it does cause people to to look a little bit more inward and and want to have uh, an eye toward the data and the ultimate goal. Uh, and think about that before we uh, commit some of these uh, so called offenses. So thank you for laying that out for us. And now that I have uh, I successfully picked your brain and seen what I could get out of it, Steve, it is time for you to tell us about what you are putting in it. So tell us about a learning resource that you've engaged with that is either, you know, informing your approach or this just got you excited these days. Sure. So mine, it's a new one and, and it's probably a little bit non-traditional, but I recently joined the board of our local chapter of Make-A-Wish. And so now I'm meeting other board members for Make-A-Wish and, and the learning piece of it is twofold. So for one, I, I tend to get fairly I'll say hyper-focused and myopic, workaholic, you, you know, the kind of type A, type A personality. Mm -hmm. And I lose sight of uh, some of the, the broader, you know, universe around us sometimes. Make-A-Wish is such a phenomenal organization and learning from other board members there and learning about their mission has done two things for me. One, it's really exposed me to an area of uh, the world that I just was not as exposed to before. And it's one where I think I can, you know, do some good. But two, it's really connected me with other people in the community who have different points of view and uh, they all have different learning resources and, and this kind of, you know, back and forth best practice sharing has been a nice, you know, kind of unintended consequence of that as well. So my, I guess my message is for others that haven't engaged or, or reached out into their communities to find ways to participate. If you're hyper-focused on your work, like I have uh, been historically, you know, it's been a great opportunity to expand my horizons. I'd, I'd offer your listeners the same recommendation. I love it so much. Yes, yes, yes. People are a learning resource. Am I right? No doubt. No <laughs> doubt. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. And so you've done it. You've made me a fan. And just like me, I know that you've made fast fans of everybody listening. So tell us, tell us how we can keep up with you and connect with you, Steve. So best way is LinkedIn. That's uh, my preferred uh, outlet. It's where I probably uh, spend most of my time from a social perspective. So feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, I, did, I do have those uh, other kind of petty annoyances that we talked about today. I've got a handful of others that I'm going to be uh, you know, publishing as a sequel to the first one. And feel free to add your own on there as well. And maybe we can all learn from it and, and pick a better path going forward. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Like you mentioned or alluded to here, we did only get to actually discuss two or three of these and you've got more content around this coming out. So we got no choice. We got to have you on again. <laughs> Can't wait. This has been a blast, it. Nikki. Thank you so much okay. for having me. Thanks so much, Steve. You bet. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.